Welcome everyone to our weekly seminar series um, at the Schwartz Reisman Institute. And this week, we're very, very happy to have Suresh Venkata Subramaniam, a professor of computer science and data science at Brown University, uh, join us. So Suresh's research focuses on algorithmic fairness and the impact of automated decision making in society. And he's recently finished a stint as assistant director for, the, for science and justice in the White House Office of Science and Tech Policy. There, he helped co-author a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. Prior to Brown, uh, Suresh was at the University of Utah, where he received an, uh, an NSF Career Award for his work in the geometry of probability. His research on algorithmic fairness has received press coverage across North America and Europe, including NPR Science Friday, NBC, and CNN. So in this talk, uh, Suresh is going to dissect for us the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, discuss what its authors were trying to achieve, and talk about some of the issues at this intersection of tech and policy. So without much ado, over to you, Suresh. Thanks a lot, Rahul. Let me just share my screen. Great. Um, thanks a lot for having me here. I'm looking forward to talking with you all about this. And uh, again, if you have any cl clarifying questions, please post them and I'm, I'll hopefully be able to answer them. So um, a lot of questions about the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. And so I'm hoping to answer them all in this hour. And so let me briefly start with a bit of a sort of an introduction to myself. Uh, my journey to where I am today is kind of unusual and um, and perhaps sort of shows that you know tech people can get involved in sort of deeper policy discussions as well. So I, I you know, I, I after I finished my PhD, I spent a lot of time working at at t Labs before I moved, as Rahul mentioned, to the University of Utah. And for a long time, you know, I would I would describe myself as an uh, a not very woke computer scientist. I just did you know things that I was interested in and in algorithms and data mining and machine learning. It was uh, soon after my uh, sabbatical and uh, my sabbatical had started when I went to Berkeley and spent time there at Google that I started thinking about the broader implications of work in machine learning. This was 2013, and while you know the deep learning revolution had just about started then, it wasn't. It, it, it felt like a stretch, but not too much of a stretch to ask what happens if machine learning controls everything in our lives. And to me, it was a question that was in the future at the time. And then I thought, you know, what would happen if, what, what would we want from our algorithms if that were the case? So one thing led to another. I started working with uh, folks at the ACLU. Uh, I was on the board of the ACLU of Utah. And I started thinking about these issues of algorithmic discrimination. And... Um, in the process of doing this research, a number of things came to light about how to think about fairness and machine learning, how to think about automation more broadly. I used to work in what I called algorithmic fairness, but that aperture has broadened out to a broader investigation of the impact of um, ML and this automated decision-making in general in society. So uh, along the way to the White House, I spent time advising various state and local uh, officials, both in New York City, Philadelphia, and the you know, and state of Utah as well. Um, and then around um, May of 2021, I, I went to the White House. And as Rahul mentioned, I helped, you know, as part of a broad team that built the blueprint uh, for an AI Bill of Rights, which I'll talk about briefly. And after that, I came back to Brown. So I uh, I joined Brown. I decided, you know, changing one job during the pandemic wasn't enough. So I decided to change two. And so I um, moved to Brown at the same time as moving to the White House. And so now that I'm back at Brown, I now direct uh, a new Center for Tech Responsibility, whose mission is to redefine CS research and technology to center the needs, problems, and aspirations of, of all of us, including those that technology has left behind. And I'm happy to take questions on that at the end if people are interested. So without further ado, let me, uh, with that brief introduction, let me just sort of give you an outline of what I would like to talk about here today and uh, and then just jump right into it. So I want to talk a little bit, and maybe for this audience, it may not be so necessary about why we might need an AI Bill of Rights, what the timeline was for developing this document, what it looks like, and how to understand what is a 73-page you know, document, how to sort of structure it in your head. What are the, some of the design choices that may not be obvious, but were manifest in how we wrote the document out, and what's coming next, and what new issues are coming up? So let's start with the first thing, why we need or needed an AI Bill of Rights. <clears throat> again, this, this is again, probably obvious to most of you already, but I was putting together some remarks for a, for a Senate hearing that I testified at today morning. And I, I wanna make a list of all the different places I could think of where ML is being used. And sadly, almost always with some problems. And that list got really long, right? It was, you know, five, six years ago, I would have talked about policing and people are beginning to think about hiring and not too many other things. 
But in 2023, you would be hard pressed to find an area of your life which is not touched by automated decision making in some form or the other. And the list is right here. I won't read them all out, but it's a long list of things. And it covers every stage of your life, every aspect of your life. It's, it's quite um, comprehensive. And, um, and it's not just that there's ML being deployed in society. Of course, for the last few months, we've all been transfixed by chat GPT and other generative AI systems that represent in some sense a new frontier or a new direction. I don't personally think that they change the way we have to think about these questions, but they've in a weird way democratized the concerns around AI because everyone can log into chat GPT, get an account and ask it questions like, why do we need an AI bill of rights? And by the way, that answer is pretty good. I have to say, I'm, I'm quite impressed by the answer it gave. Uh, so given all of these issues that we're now seeing and given the urgency of these problems, because, you know, Without being too hyperbolic, people are literally dying, you know, in at least in some cases, as a result of the use of automated decision systems. What do we need? And so our goal going into this was really, how do we protect people in the age of algorithms? Again, the goal was not to identify risks and benefits in particular piece of technology. That, that's a fine goal, and, and there are many people who are doing that. But the goal is to say, what is it, what are the harms we're seeing, and how can we distill out those harms in a way? That is actionable. That is and that is clear. That is universal, and that is not going to have to change every time the tech changes, which is important because policymaking takes time, and uh, you don't want policies to become outdated before you can even put them out, given the speed at which tech changes. So, given that goal, what was the process? So, the process of doing this, and this I'll give you a brief timeline, was in around in October 2021, the process was kicked off with an op-ed in Wired basically arguing for the need to put together a Bill of Rights for an AI-powered world. So this was an, uh, an op-ed that uh, Landra Nelson, my boss, had written uh, at the time, sort of articulating what we uh, what the elements of such a Bill of Rights need to have. Of course, we didn't know at the time what it was going to look like. We just had a sense that this was something that was needed. And so that timeline looked something like this. Starting with the op-ed in October of 2021, we had a bunch of convenings, listening sessions. I'll say a bit more about that. Uh, and uh, request for information, RFI is a short term for that. And we spent a lot of time, of course, drafting, right? Drafting the, the, the document and, uh, through roughly April of the next year, all rough estimates. And then there was a very long process of getting interagency feedback. When I say interagency, what I mean is, you know, we were sitting in the White House. But of course, there are a number of government agencies that have a lot of great, a lot of insights and concerns about AI in their specific domains, which is a sort of a, another point that I'll talk about later, namely how to think about AI regulation in a vertical per sector or in a horizontal across sector sense. So this process took you know, a good five, five, six more months. I actually left uh, before the end of this process, because I left in August. Because that's just you know, my term ended up, you know, my term ended at the time, and I had to go back to Brown. But the process continued on. And then there was a formal clearance process by which it means, I mean, a process by which agencies are formally asked to approve of this document being released. And then finally, in October uh, of 2022, uh, almost a year to the day from the original op ed, this document was put out, which is, you know, by some accounts, in government is very fast for something like this, for something that was a broad, you know, government wide document. Um, and so, you know, that, by some account, that, that was a very uh, impressive task. By some, by my feeling, it was it took way too long. But that's another story. So, I mentioned the the interaction. Then, one of the important things that was being carried out at OSTP at the time, which we thought was very important, was to make sure we were getting consultations from as many people in as many different sectors as possible. So we had six public panels. And if you go to the White House webpage for the Bill of Rights, you'll see links to videos for all these public panels. These are public panels on specific topics in the realms of um, health, uh, consumer protection, uh, urban, urban settings, and civil society, and so on. Many and criminal justice and many other forms like that. There were these six panels with experts and you know, lots of uh, useful and val valuable information gleaned from those panels. There were two listening sessions where literally we put up a Zoom link and said, Anyone who wants to come can come and share their views for two minutes. And we will just listen and record it. And not record it, I mean, recording, but we just take notes on, on what they said. And we had you know, a number of people coming and contributing, people ranging from organizations to individual citizens coming to share their thoughts on what in, uh, an AI Bill of Rights might look like and, and, and so on. We had a request for information. Uh, they got many responses. 
<laughs> about a specific um, use case of, of AI, namely the use of biometrics in um, for identification and for other uh, applications, for example, in hiring and so on. And then we had a long list of consultations. We had literally had an email address. People said, email us and we'll try and set up a meeting with you. And we had a bunch of meetings with uh, people in the civil society, in the private sector, and, and so on. And so that process it sort of generated a lot of input for the drafting of the document and things we need to think about. And you know, this is talking about AI use across government and across the private sector is a big deal. It's a big thing. And, and it, there's no one person or group of people who has knowledge about all of these things. So these consultations are very helpful to get a better perspective on how the concerns are likely to manifest themselves in different sectors. So that's the sort of rough outline of the of the of the blueprint and how it uh, of the structure of the way we developed the blueprint um, and how we got to the finish line with it. What I wanted to do is spend some time talking about the structure of the document itself. This is something we spent a lot of time thinking about and were very um, uh, deliberate and uh, careful and thoughtful about uh, how we wanted to structure it. And so that structure is something I want to talk about. It also helps understand how the how the document why the document looks the way it looks. So of course there are five rights themselves, um, and they're very simple to understand. At least I, I think so. Um, that systems should work, and they should work well. Right? We should be protected from unsafe or ineffective systems. And it's almost surprising that I have to say that, and that we had to say that. But it's also the truth that so many systems, AI systems, are put out there that don't actually work. They have a facsimile of working. They seem like they might work. But when push comes to shove, if you say, okay, what is the basis, the scientific basis or the validation basis on which you want to deploy this out to affect people's lives, you get a big silence. And that's very disturbing. And that shouldn't happen. The second principle, of course, is that algorithms should not discriminate. And, and I'll say a bit more about this particular one because even explaining what that means is kind of tricky. The third principle is about data control. Don't use your data recklessly without your control. Um, now, this often gets confused with the concern about privacy, and I think privacy is an important part of this, but some of the bigger concerns about the use of data in machine learning is not so much the issue that people's individual data is being used, it's that data is being used and reused and further reused and sold and transferred to the, to, to the point where the original context where this data was collected is lost, and the, then the machine learning models that are built based on this data no longer have any connection to the either the application they're trying to solve or what the data was originally supposed to be telling them. So this broader concern around the data propagation and, and reuse is what this principle is about. Another one, which I'll call a sort of a transparency and process principle is you should at least be told when automation is being used and how it contributes to outcomes that impact you. This again is surprisingly important. If I don't know an AI system is being used, none of these principles matter because I don't know to ask whether they're being satisfied. So that right to notice, if you wish, is something that's very important. And also the idea of explainability, that you should be able to explain the results of a system, which is also very important because if you can't explain how a system works, we don't know if it's doing anything reasonable. I'm actually teaching a class right now at Brown on fairness and automation, and we just finished a couple of lectures on explanation in algorithms. And it's you know, I asked the students, why do you think we should have explanation? And they came up with a bunch of different answers, all of which make sense. You need robustness. You need to check for bias. You need to be able to debug your code. This is important to do. And these systems that affect people should do it. The final principle is of one of human consideration. The thing is, systems will fail. Machine learning systems especially will fail. And when they fail, you need some way to get out of the trap of failure that you got yourself into. You need to have a backup. You need to have some intervention. You need to have human consideration, someone who can consider and remedy your problems. And you need to have maybe pathways to not have to use automation. There are many reasons why automation may be disadvantages for some people. If you're maybe asked to sign in for some benefits by taking a selfie on a smartphone, if you don't have the right kind of smartphone or the right kind of camera, you may not be able to access the benefits. And that doesn't seem right either. So these are the five principles. And I should say, you know, at some point in the drafting, I don't remember when, we had 14. So, you know, this five is not a sacred number, but it turns out to work very well as a collection of easy, easy to state principles that do capture most of the concerns that we have with the use of automation in society. The next question that comes up is, well, what should this apply to? 
And if you've been following some of the discussions around this, both in the US and the EU, there's a lot of discussion about, well, how do we define AI? And oddly enough, for a document titled an AI Bill of Rights, we didn't actually do that, deliberately so. We did what we were calling internally was a two-part test. We said, first of all, any automated system that can impact your rights, opportunities, and access is relevant or within scope for potentially being under the purview of this document, but the impact should be meaningful. So a thing that fails the first test maybe is um, a Spotify recommendation system. It doesn't really impact your civil rights opportunities for advancement or access to critical resources, uh, unless Spotify is a critical resource for you, but it, typically that's not what I'm thinking about here. And so that would not be something that's within scope, right? Now you might say, oh, something like a Roomba is also probably not within scope, except that three weeks ago, I saw an article where Roomba had been taking pictures of people in the bathroom without their permission and uploading it to a server that ended up on a Facebook server. So now the situation gets a little more complicated even for a Roomba in terms of impacting civil rights and privacy. But this idea of a two-part test where you first say, okay, look, it's, we're not going to define AI, we're going to talk about automated systems, we're going to look for meaningful impact on these things, was for us a way to get around some of the discussions around how to define AI and the concern that any definition of AI will be something that people can then try to wiggle out of by defining the system as not doing AI. So, you know, if you're doing linear regression, it's AI if you want to get venture funding. It's not AI if you're, you're going to be asked to do something about it, for example. There was also an important focus on communities, and I'm very proud that I can quote a Fox News uh, screen capture from a few weeks ago, where Laura Ingram, needless to say, was not being complimentary about the blueprint, but did mention this particular quote, that designers, developers, and deployers of automated systems should take proactive and continuous measures to protect individuals and communities from algorithm discrimination. This is again important because sometimes the, the theory of harm is not individually focused, it's focused on a community. But by limiting the way many of our laws are, limiting uh, the notion of harm to an individual, it prevents people in the community from having standing to appeal or to complain or to sort of ask for redress if some system is doing wrong by them because you can't point to a specific individual. And so that's another important aspect of this document and how we wrote it as well. So that's the sort of the broad goals and the scope of the document. And what does it look like? Well, it has the five principles, but it has this other thing, this thing called a technical companion. The point of the technical companion was to go beyond just an articulation of principles. There are I mean, many principles documents that have been put out there. There's the OECD principles. There were principles uh, by the General Partnership on AI. There's a bunch of principles you can come up with. It's not hard to find them. But I, what, what, what was missing, I think, what is missing in all of them is a map to something more actionable going from principles to practice. And given that we had computer scientists in the team who understood very well and had done research on the issues of how to actually deploy these systems in a way that captured these principles, we felt it was important to try and articulate a, what exactly, why exactly each principle is important, what the expectations would be for any implementation. And then show that this was actually at least plausible by giving examples of how these principles are already being moved into practice. And so one thing that was interesting for us when we were working on this effort was that it didn't feel like we were doing something out of the blue that was crazy because we could find examples that captured the spirit and letter of these principles that were already out there in the world, but, it, but in somewhat piecemeal way. And so one of the things the document does is try to highlight those efforts. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. So what does one of these um, principles look like? So we'll just take one of them, the one on algorithmic discrimination. So you're gonna see a bit of a word uh, wall here, but I would like you to highlight and focus your attention on a few of them. So the high level, the principle says, you should not face discrimination by algorithms and systems should be used and designed in an equitable way. The question of what it means to discriminate by algorithm is not clear at all in the US and the legal frameworks around anti-discrimination, it is very difficult to sort of pin this down. So one of the things that you know, came up here is this idea of algorithmic discrimination occurring when automated systems contribute to unjustified differential treatment or impacts, disfavoring people based on these criteria. So this, this fine line of saying, you know, we're not, it wasn't the point that we were saying that all differential treatment was bad, but that unjustified treatment was bad. 
or unjustified differential impacts were bad, especially if they were based on race, color, ethnicity, and so on. And again, there are many ways to unpack this and question what does it mean to be based on and so on, but that was the, the, the point there. And then, like I said, each of the principles, we list out examples of why this principle is important. In other words, what would not happen if this principle were already in place? So, you know, again, this is a topic that many of you are probably very familiar with. There's a whole list of examples. There's, and these are not hypotheticals. These are examples that for the most, for all, mostly are drawn from actual news articles about actual scenarios. So bias and loan pricing for historically black colleges and university applicants. Hiring tools that are biased towards, or in this case, actually away women. That was a mistake in my slide. Uh, predictive tools for college dropout that were racially biased. In other words, tools that are trying to predict whether someone would drop out from college. Of course, risk assessment tools in criminal justice, sentiment analyzers, individuals with disabilities flagged for proctoring as, as, a being, as possibly cheating. And the list goes on and on. And so what each principle does, and this one does is say, okay, look, if we're going to say that an automated system should not you know, in, cause algorithm discrimination against people, these are the things you need to do in your system to help mitigate the worst of these kinds. So you need to do proactive assessments of equity. You need to make sure you have representative and robust data. You must make sure to guard against proxies by measurements. You must make sure your systems are accessible. You must do disparity assessments. You must do ongoing monitoring and mitigation. All of these things are not, A, not unreasonable things, B, that you know, good designers kind of do already to some extent. So some of this is enshrining these practices that are maybe piecemeal and scattered into one place. And then also, you know, along with protecting the public, you must demonstrate the system does protect against discrimination. And a, and a sort of a fault line, a, a sort of a theme, I guess, that will go through all these principles, this idea that you need independent evaluation and reporting. So the expectations list out all these things in some level of detail. That's, that's what needs to happen. And so if you see the why the text is so big, <clears throat> it's because it mentions all these things proactive and continuous measures, designing systems in an equitable way, using equity assessments, using representative data, protecting against proxies, and so on. And again, like I said, none of these things are you know, completely out of the blue, you know, blue sky dream, dream activities. They are captured by activities that are already in practice. We are seeing examples of this in mortgage lending and how people are doing now hiring for people with disabilities doing disparity assessments in healthcare access, and doing standards work for accessibility, for like, for example, the National Institute of uh, Science, Standards and Technology work, NIST work. This also, the reason to do this was to point out that there are many ways the principles and the Bill of Rights can be made real. One of the, you know, one of the broader complaints that was uh, generated after the Bill of Rights was released was, well, this is just a white paper. It's not a law, it doesn't have any teeth. And there were, I think, two big answers to that question, to that sort of complaint. I think one is that this is not a single shot effort where you write this document, try to pass a law. And in the White House, we don't actually pass law. That's not our job. That's Congress's job. Um, there is many, many more things you can do, which includes voluntary standards, which includes getting you know states to do something about this, look, focusing on specific sectors. So that was an important point to make here, that there are many different levers of change and you shouldn't think of the standard document as only leading to one possible outcome. While legislation, of course, is the most welcome one, there are many others as well. Um, some underlying other themes that came out through the, through the different principles, but not necessarily limited to any one of them, is, as I mentioned, a focus on reporting, right? That all of these, all these claims that your system has been tested for disparities or is explainable or has clear notice, are not, it's not enough to make claims. You have to generate uh, proof in the form of a report summarizing what your system has done. That can be reviewed to see, and on an ongoing basis to see if your system in fact is satisfying the, the, the requirements of the other bl blueprint. Uh, we focus on harms, not on technology. What does that mean? It means we're not trying to index on, okay, here's this piece of tech, this AI tech, generative AI, and we want to protect ourselves against the harms from it. What we're saying is that no matter what the tech, and the tech changes very quickly, no matter what the tech, the harms manifest in relatively similar ways. And that's where we want to focus our attention. So that even if we replace, you know, I don't know, a linear classifier by a support vector machine, by a neural network, by some foundation model, the impact on people would be the same, or the impact on people could be the same, or needs to be evaluated the same way. And that's what's important to us. 
Um, again, I mentioned earlier about the definition of AI and why it was strategically useful not to do that. The last thing I want to mention on this front is this whole idea of a horizontal versus a vertical approach, by which I mean having something that's very sector specific, vertical, or having something across the board, across sectors, horizontal. And so this document is, of course, it's a high level EO document of the White House. So it's designed to be somewhat horizontal while recognizing their special areas and sensitive where sensitive attributes are used, especially in education in, in health and in uh, finance, where you might have something more specific for that particular agency that's dealing with this. And we, we can talk more about the trade-offs between these different approaches in a bit. Okay. Um, so we put out the document in October, and the question is, what's next? We, we, the intention was never that the blueprint would be the end of the story. It was always going to be the beginning of the story. The goal was to do more. In fact, you know, I'm giving, I'm, I'm delivering this talk to you actually from DC, where I first testified in a Senate hearing, and then I'm part of an all-day meeting of folks trying to think about how to sort of push out more uh, work that supports the articulation in the in the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. There's a bunch of legislation that's out there. At the federal level, there is the Algorithmic Accountability Act that's been uh, pushed by a number of senators and, and folks in the House that is trying to essentially enshrine the idea of impact assessments as a formal process for when you when purchasing or using any any sorry, all algorithmic system that's public impacting in some way. I mentioned the issues with data. The American Data Privacy Protection Act, ADPA, is sort of under review right now. Again, we'll see what happens over the next months and maybe a year, but the goal is to see if we can get protections on data in a way that's similar to GDPR, especially with a focus on things like secondary data use, where you know the, you collect the data for your purpose, that's fine, but if you sell it to someone else, now that becomes a problem, which is what I mentioned was one of the issues with data used in machine learning. There's been hearings on AI happening. The one I came from today was in the Senate. There's another one in the House. I testified at a, at, a, at a hearing of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which looks at bias in hiring algorithms, and they're interested in pushing forward on, in this direction. Um, I, you know, my my student and I wrote an article about some new draft regulations in Colorado. Uh, well, maybe I'll skip to that. There's there's a bunch of state level action. The one I mentioned is in Colorado, a uh, new regulation on the use of like, data and insurance, but there's also bills being pushed through in, in California. Uh, Vermont already passed an algorithm accountability bill. Connecticut is doing one right now, and so is Washington, and there are probably others as well. What's interesting with all of these state level actions that are trying to push the work of the Bill of Rights forward is that they are exposing almost a new set of questions that we need to understand the answers to. I don't necessarily have all the answers yet, but they are definitely forcing us to think about, okay, how are you going to implement this in practice? So some of the things that come up, what should be the scope? Should it focus on the private sector or only the government or both? Different people have different points of view on this. The argument for, of course, doing private sector and government stands for itself. The argument for focusing on government is interesting because, um, well, the government has more control over what the government does for one thing and much more control than they do over the private entities, which is perhaps a good thing. But also the government is a client. The government is a buyer of software. It's a big buyer of software. It has a lot of money to buy software. So if government institutes certain practices and how it procures AI systems, then companies have to comply and that might change their practices. Kind of how, you know, when GDPR came out, US companies that want to operate in Europe had to change the way they operate. Another question of scope is, do we want high-risk systems or all systems? I mentioned how we tried to architect this in the, in the blueprint and different states are thinking about this in different ways, whether you, you know, preemptively identify high-risk systems or do it as part of assessment, which brings us to this fourth point on proactive assessments or not. Should you do algorithmic impact assessments ahead of time? Should you do a lightweight assessment that will then trigger a more heavy assessment in case something is flagged in the lightweight assessment and so on? Another challenge in the US context is this notion of how, where this work should live. Should it be in a single agency, a brand new one maybe, or should it be distributed across agencies? In the US, regulation is very sectoral, laws are very sectoral. In other words, what, you know, the notion of discrimination for, I don't know, education might not quite carry over to a notion of discrimination in say, uh, the world of labor and, and so on. And so, um, whether you have a single agency that does this or you distribute the work across agencies, something again, different entities are trying to discover right and think about right now. 
Another mechanism question is, do you want to hardwire priorities in legislation or you have an advisory board that makes the decisions for you? Again, there's a trade-off between having local experts who can think about your local context versus making sure that the local experts aren't co-opted or don't end up doing what you want because you didn't specify in the legislation. And finally, again, the ongoing debate about using AI as a definition for scope, using automated decision systems as a definition for scope, they keep going back and forth. So that's, um, that's sort of more or less what I wanted to talk about. I think I ended a little bit early, but um, I'm hoping we can have a good uh, Q&A um, about this. Um, uh, I think that the, there are probably many things I could say, but I want to make sure I can answer people's questions and sort of focus my time on where what is interesting to the audience. So with that, I'll just I'll conclude here. Uh, like I said, I'm at Brown. I'm part of the Data Science Institute. I just started a new center for tech responsibility, and I'm happy to take your questions now. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much for that, uh, Suresh. Um, so we're going to move on to our discussion period, and we're going to welcome questions from all participants. Please use the raised hand or chat functions in Zoom if you'd like to ask a question, and we welcome you to turn on your camera if you're comfortable doing so. Our team will send you a request uh, for you to unmute when it's your turn to speak. So while we're waiting for questions to trickle in, um, I, I was wondering if I could kick us off. There's certain scenarios in which, you know, one of the rights that you talked about was this notion of data ownership. And there's certainly scenarios in which um, people can argue about who owns the data. And uh, for example, in healthcare, uh, hospitals certainly have a mandate to improve the quality of care that's practiced within the institutions. And they certainly use the data within the hospitals to do that. But at the same time, patients have a right to do it extract the data and it is their data, so to speak, because uh, the consequence of their illness is perhaps what generated it. So in situations where you have these two parties and you know, there's scenarios where their interests align in some cases and do not align in other cases. How do you think about enforcing a law in the context of particularly that right? I was wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, that's a very good example, right? Because it shows that there are real tensions and real challenges among stakeholders who are all trying to pull together to do the right thing, right? So patients obviously would like to share their data because it'll maybe help them get better treatment. Um, hospitals would like to collect the data because it might help them figure out what this better treatment might look like. So these are all valid goals, even though they're in opposition. My argument for why it feels like they're in opposition is because we haven't yet found the right language to talk about data and ownership and data flows. So in this particular case, so the concern for the patient is, well, if I hand over my data to the doctor and they use it for um, doing some more research and pooling together research, this by itself should not be a problem. The problem is, well, does the hospital now sell this data to some third party who now tries to target me some way? Are they selling it to an insurance company who might change my rates? Am I sharing my data for the purposes of research that's going to benefit people who are who don't look like me? Because of the benefits of this research is often not equ equitably distributed. So I find that these questions about who gets to own the data are questions that only make sense within a frame that we've already accepted as the default frame. And sometimes you have to lift yourself one step out and say, well, why do we have this frame in the first place where we're trapped in this question of who owns the data? It's because we don't have proper data protections. We don't have prescriptions against secondary and tertiary use. We don't have prescriptions against monetizing data to selling it to folks who probably sh you know, didn't need to have access in the first place. We don't have ways for me to contribute my data to a research project, but pull it back when I feel like I don't want to. We just don't, because we don't have the tools and the language to expand the frame, it feels like we're stuck within the frame where we keep having the same conversations over and over again. And what I would say is we need to expand the frame. And I think technically, as a computer scientist, I would say we need to be able to come up with better tools to allow this kind of protected data sharing, to allow data removal. There are students at the center here who are working on secure data deletion, for example, where your data doesn't just get deleted. It's as if it was never there. And you, the user, have control over it. And even... There is no way for the data to not get deleted. That's where the cryptographic magic comes into play. But there's no way for it to not be deleted after a set amount of time based on your criteria. So I think there's a combination of better technical tools, better reframing of the question, and a, and a willingness to reimagine right, how we understand our relationships with data and with stakeholders. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call on Vahid and then Laura. 
the heat go ahead yeah sure okay hi Suresh. thanks for uh, for the great talk uh i was wondering if this all these blueprint regulations are only for fully automated decisions you know or sometimes they, they can just be as just one tool to help experts to make decisions and sometimes it is not clear to draw a line in between so you know to be concrete so this this regulations are only for fully automated. Right. And so your question basically is, how do you or can you draw the line between a fully automated system that makes a decision or a system that provides assistance? So there's a phrase that I hear a lot and I've used a lot, right? make, inform, or, just, or, or, or um, assist in decision-making. As you pointed out, there's no clear line here. In fact, we have research now that says that even if you, so this is in the context of pretrial risk assessments, even if all your tool does is provide a score as a guidance to a judge, the judge might start taking that score as gospel rather than as a recommendation. So it starts moving from being an assistant to something that's almost fully automated, but not quite. And so this is why the line is unclear to draw. And that's why I don't personally view any distinction between systems that assist versus systems that make decisions. I think that often the goal is to make that distinction, put the law in place for things that make decisions, and then say, well, we weren't really making it. We're just providing assistance. And I've seen this happen in the context of hiring algorithms, where the company that's making the tool that does the ranking gives it to the employer. So the company says, well, we just give them a tool. It's up to them to decide what to do. The company says, well, they gave us a tool. We don't know how it works. So we have to use the numbers they gave us. And so I'm trying, you know, this uh, avoiding this sort of whack-a-mole or this kind of this hot potato game that, pe that people are playing here is, is, uh, is important. And that's why I don't, in my mind, make a distinction between fully or partially or recommending or whatever. I see, because in some sense, you know, one can just say it is something like a search engine. I'm just searching over the data that is given to me. And so if something is wrong, it's because of the data on the algorithm. And so I guess, yeah, that's one, one thing that is not clear to me how to handle. Thanks. All right, Laura. Uh, sorry, so I'm meeting. Uh, thank you very much for that very uh, interesting talk. Um, I want to ask you a bit more about regulation. Can you tell me who, like I, I, I'm pretty convinced on the need for regulation and the importance of it, but I'm less clear on who does it, wh where they're situated in our institutions, and if it needs to be sector specific. So, you know, I work in healthcare, so I'm thinking specifically about healthcare versus other sectors. So right. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's funny because I got asked that question today morning by one of the centers as well, right? So. Um, the FTC has shown a lot of interest in pushing back on claims of AI effectiveness, on claim, on you know, on on whether systems are being discriminatory or not. And so the FTC and their new office of tech and their office of technology and the support they've gotten to build this office, I think, is one example of a place where you can think of regulation happening. The EEOC is, you know, his job is to enforce um, anti-discrimination law in the context of hiring. So that's a natural place to think about the scrutiny of AI systems used in hiring settings. And I, and they, I know they're looking at this. You talked about healthcare. And of course, you know the FDA has been looking into rulemaking around um, whether AI can be classified as a medical device and what that means. Uh, HHS is, is uh, updating their guidance on uh, discrimination as part of Obamacare to uh, incorporate algorithmic discrimination. So there are a lot of agencies that have regulatory power, and it, it, this might need to be distributed across those agencies, depending on the context. And that, that's perfectly acceptable because agencies know the sectors well, like the Colorado, the, I mentioned the Colorado Division of Insurance, putting out their own draft regulations on, ins on the use of data in insurance. But the thing is, this is where this horizontal vertical divide is not so much a divide as a continuum that on the one hand, you do need to have things that are sector specific because those sectors are very specific and, and, and they're very, there are special issues in each sector that are important to pay attention to. And there are laws that are specific to each sector that you have to pay attention to. However, there has to be some 
you know, broad understanding of how you have to go about doing this regulation. And that's where the more horizontal view of this comes from. So I see these interactions going back and forth. You have some high level picture, you instantiate for an agency that gives you an example, you go back up and you go back down. So I, it, it's, it's happening a lot. So I think, you know, the EU would say, no, no, we want to have a broad horizontal regulation across because the EU structure works that way. The US structure doesn't work that way. And so I don't think the structure itself limits what you can do. You just have to organize it a little bit differently. All right, uh, Tom, go ahead. Um, hi, thanks for the talk. So I have a very practical question, which is, you know, let's say you're a researcher and you're just developing some mm -hmm. algorithms for some, let's say, prediction tasks that you want to deploy in a hospital. And so far you've just played around with a bunch of anonymized data and you seem to have something that works like what is really the first thing you should start thinking about if you want to deploy your model in a way that it conforms with a lot of the guidelines you've been saying like is it to just focus on doing a lot of diverse testing the first thing you should focus on is finding partners who understand the domain you're working in if you if you, you mentioned healthcare of some kind uh you mentioned a healthcare application yeah it's just a general example i mean like just thinking a bit more how we can take some of these ideas and put them directly into our right research. but that but that's where i think the the domain so let's let's pretend you're working with some healthcare yeah. data maybe you're doing something to um to improve clinical care by trying to predict you know doing some triage prediction for example my first question to you would be are you actually working with doctors are you working with a hospital if you're not i would say stop right there <laughs> Do not think that you should go out and deploy this till you actually start working with folks, talk to them about the data they're collecting, make sure you understand where the data is coming from, what it means in context. And I'll say that, I mean, your question is, is very relevant. I think I feel your question because, you know, I think, I don't know what your background is, but for me as a computer scientist, I feel like I want to be able to do this kind of thing and then deploy it. And, and I'm, I, 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 we often train students to think that way, or you do some ML, you get some data and you do something with it that looks good, you should go deploy it. And I think that's the wrong way. That's frankly, has led, you know, through no fault of anyone in particular, has led to some of the problems we're in. A lack of understanding of context and what the real questions are <laughs> versus, oh, I have this cool ML problem I want to solve. And so that's why I would say, if you, if you think you have something that might be interesting, stop and talk to the people who know the domain and see whether what you're doing is actually helpful. And if it is, then, then start to figure out how exactly you want to incorporate your ideas into the work they're doing. And if it's even relevant to do that, if you're actually solving problems that actually needs to be solved or not. Okay, that's very interesting and helpful. So consulting with a lot of domain experts to really make sure your problem is well posed. Well, it's kind of, kind of funny if I might sort of follow up on that, right? So I was working on a paper with um, uh, on some of the concerns around some of the data sets used in criminal justice algorithms. Some of, some of you may have heard this data set called Compass from the Compass algorithm that's, that people are now using a lot to test different kinds of algorithms. And we're writing a paper saying, you really shouldn't be doing this because, and this is a paper that consists of computer scientists, statisticians, people from the ACLU and criminologists all coming together to write this one paper, basically saying that this is not how you actually think about context and meaning for data because the compass data has been stripped of all its meaning and context in any, and it applied to one county in Florida, but it may not apply in New Mexico or in Utah or in somewhere else. And the criminologists would remark on the fact that, you know, they spent like two years collecting a data set, working with local people, trying to build a model. The model is an afterthought. It's mostly collecting the data and trying to understand the data. Whereas again, as a computer scientist, our practice is find a data set somewhere, build a model and spend a lot of time training the model. It's a very different world. And I think that's, we have to deprogram ourselves in that kind of world a little bit to, to, to make sure we are not just causing more trouble when we go into a domain. So it's not about consulting with domain experts, it's starting with the fact that, okay, I want to solve, I want to reduce the abstraction level of my design to not be predictor, not even binary classifier, but Oh, there's a problem in healthcare that I want to solve, and I think that's a that's that's that going that way and asking the question that way is much more likely to allow you to uncover issues that could become a problem later on. Okay, thank you very much. All right, I'll read out a question that we have from chat. Um, thank you for the fascinating talk. I wanted to know whether it's been considered to uh, bring in citizen opinions on the regulation of AI government and private sector. There's definitely a bit of a barrier in the general public in understanding the real broader impacts of data collection and data ownership, for example, in, in truly understanding terms and conditions to some tech products. 
uh, hence I understand the transparency and clarity is one aspect of involving citizens. So I'm curious whether this is an aspect of this uh, facet that introduces the project for citizens to have the ability to be informed and to process the various branches of, you know, this AI, uh, of AI implementation and ensure that the projects are equitable and transparent. So I have three things to say to this. Uh, two of them are in the document and one more thing I'll add to it. It is very important to bring in individual and community perspective. This is because the people who know the most about how they're going to be impacted are, you know, people in communities who are who can tell you. Oh, we they put up all these uh, surveillance cameras, and this is what happened to our ability to just hang out and talk to each other because of the because of the fear of surveillance. You don't get to hear that top down. You only get to hear that by engaging. So one of the core expectations that we mention in the in the blueprint regarding the the effectiveness testing of any software system of any automated system is that you must have stakeholder input. You must, you must engage with communities and you must do this before you build your system. The problem is if you build your system first and get a bunch of people to say, okay, this is a system we build, what do you think? There's not much they can say at that point, it's too late. You have to bring people in early on at the design stage or even before the design stage to understand what the problems actually are. In fact, to that end, I'm, I'm helping, I'm co-organizing a workshop in May to bring researchers and community advocates together so we can understand from community advocates what are the concerns they have, how to have these more fruitful conversations about where research should be going, rather than just essentially, well, making up problems in our own mind, which is how you know we, I, I've been trained to do. So that's one point I wanna make about the importance of community engagement. Another point I want to make about the, um, the importance of community engagement is that I have now forgotten it, so I'll get to my third point. Maybe we'll come back to it. The third point I want to make is that, you know, you said that there's, uh, the question talked about how there's a lack of understanding and knowledge. And that's true. Weirdly enough, even though, you know, it's easy to make fun of chat GPT, I feel like what it has done is democratize the concerns around AI for a much broader public. You know, if there's a problem with a healthcare algorithm, then maybe someone who's being subjected to it might hear it. If there's a problem with a criminal justice algorithm, someone who's had to go up for a bail hearing might might understand what the issue is. But ChatGPT somehow affects everyone because everyone can try it out and see what it's doing. And that I think has helped improve or increase the level of awareness and concerns around AI. The thing I now remember, which I'd forgotten before was you talked about terms and conditions. There was an early version of the document where in the section on data privacy, we had a whole bunch of statements about terms and conditions. And then a bunch of our colleagues who are experts on this came and just removed them all one by one. And we said, why? And they said, because terms and conditions are bogus, they don't work. And they don't work for all the obvious reasons. So if you notice that one of the things we say there is talking about privacy by design. One of the things I think is very important is to say, it's not the individual's job to try and do the research, read the documentation and figure out whether they should use the system or not. We are, you know, we, I'm, I'm a computer scientist. I should be able to build a system that incorporates these, these constraints from day one that are private by design. Now, there are many reasons why, why a company might not want a system that's private by design, but that doesn't stop us from thinking about how we should do it. And in fact, data, uh, that, that uh, principle on data privacy talks about the importance of embedding privacy and protections by design into the systems rather than slapping them on after the fact. And so I totally agree with your concern about terms and conditions. I think we need to go a better way. We don't just do things and warn people that bad things could happen. We just build them better. So these bad things don't happen in the first place. Thank you. Uh, Jerry. Hey, uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, and uh, I think as a uh, graduate student working in machine learning, I, I'm more like into, um, so all the things that you talk about, it's really relative to a general public and uh, uh, to our day-to-day -day life. Uh, but uh, I'm guessing that um, as a graduate student, when we were building this, uh, our machine learning algorithm or study, we have into our routine life of uh, dealing with some data set and uh, dealing with some uh, methods that are um, somewhat within a small scope. But later on, we're going to go into different sectors and apply our knowledge. Uh, so before, now, and then, um, are there like, like any suggestion that um, you have for the graduate students uh, they're on their, currently on their training like what 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 a key idea they should keep in mind and another thing is that um you know um you raised a lot of uh, interesting examples of how states and federal 
uh, are applying the regulations on the AI for automated uh, decision models. And um, I mean, some of them we heard in the news, but uh, most of them, uh, I, I think I, I only hear it from like your talk. So is there any like a material or uh, like a, even a newsletter that we can sub sub subscribe to that specifically talks about, you know, how the new regulations or how the new uh, interesting um, uh, applications of uh, the, the the policies that's applied onto the AI algorithms or systems that that we can uh, we can receive in a periodically uh, update so that we know that uh, what ha what's happening in the world about uh, the AI regulation. Um, yeah, you should be careful what you wish for, but I'll just say that. But no, but to your points. So your first point: What should grad students do? Because right now they're busy, you know, as you said, in their own world, but they might go into a different sector later. So I'm going to reject the premise of that question, because I'm going to say that even as a grad student, you could be contributing in the space if you were so interested. Um, you don't have to wait till you leave grad school. I mean, in fact, the reason I helped set up a whole new conference, uh, well, not new anymore, but a, a whole conference on fairness, accountability, and computer systems, the conference called FACT, as a computer science conference at an ACM conference, is that to allow people to do research, even at the grad student level in this space, use their skills in machine learning and use their broader understanding of the world and their care about the world to try and publish research. So people are doing this right now. I've, I'm now seeing the first wave of grad students emerging, applying for faculty jobs, getting faculty jobs based on the work they're doing. So on the one hand, I, I, so I would say you don't need to wait, but that doesn't mean you have to work on this. Maybe you, you want to work on things you're working on. But then you can, all, but then there are, again, there are papers in these communities you can read. You can expose your, you can spend a bit more time thinking about the applications of the work you're doing. Think about where it might be getting used. If you're working on a problem, it's like, okay, why am I working on this problem? What's the motivation for this? Maybe it's theoretical motivation and that's fine. Or maybe that's coming from some domain. Go look, go look at the domain. Go look at what people are doing there. Sometimes you'll be surprised to find out, wait, this problem I'm working on, no one seems to care about, but this other one, everyone seems to care about. Maybe I should work on that instead. So the things you can do, even as a grad student, I think that are a interesting, will broaden your horizons, but also give you an opportunity to publish, which I'm, as a grad student, I'm sure you want to do as well. So there are venues for that. To your second point, um, there is it is hard. And I think, especially you know, in computer science, we don't often track policy work because that's not something we are used to doing. And I, I never did it for, until I started paying attention to this. Um, it's it's it. I actually have a project that's I'm about to start with a bunch of undergrads here at Brown, where we want to do exactly what you asked for: track all the different legislations, figure out what's going on with them, what are the interesting technical components of them, and then maybe share it out in some way. So there's there are various trackers of this kind, but I think from what you're telling me, and I'm I'm happy you said this, I see maybe an audience among computer scientists for a, a sort of a, a more legible explanation of this policy. There's plenty of policy work and the, uh, information about this in, in, I'm sitting here in an office in DC, there's plenty of stuff going on here, but maybe something that computer scientists find accessible would be very valuable to have. And, you know, we do have a sub stack for our center. Maybe we should start writing some posts about that. <laughs> so stay tuned. All right, um, Michael. Hey, thanks, thanks so much for the great talk. Um, there's two questions I wanted to ask you about sort of the notice and explanation subsection of the Bill of Rights. Um, so I was reading that like in, in the explanation section, it talks about that automated systems should both provide explanations that are technically valid, as well as being meaningful and like useful to operators and users. Mm -hmm. And so my first question is, oftentimes the most technically correct explanation for the way a machine learning system behaves the way it does is not always that that uses heuristics that non-experts find easily understandable. When we consider constructing explanations, how do you propose we balance this trade-off? So I think you are positing a trade-off between technical correctness and legibility. I'm not sure I'm convinced by that. I think maybe the problem here is how we're choosing to define technically correct. So, you know, if my my technically correct explanation of an algorithm could be, well, I did step one, then I did step two, then I did step three, and I did step four, and after step 553, I got the answer. This is technically absolutely correct, but it's not meaningful in any useful way. It doesn't give anyone anything. So I don't believe that it's impossible to have correct also are meaningful. And so maybe let me expand that a bit. One of the reasons why we say technically correct is because it's easy to give explanations that look plausible but aren't. 
For example, there are explanation systems that will look at you know, feature influence of variables and try to use that to make an argument for why certain features were influential in outcome. If they ignore, for example, that variables could be correlated or not independent, then that explanation is no longer technically valid, even though it sounds plausible. So that's the kind of thing that I, those are the kind of thing I'm thinking about here. But meaningful to a user also means many different things, right? Meaningful to whom? So if it's meaningful, um, an explanation that's meaningful to a doctor looking at a scan of an MRI looks very different to an explanation that's meaningful to a hospital administrator just trying to decide whether this is a legal charge for a, for a treatment or to a patient trying to decide what the next step should be in their treatment. So this idea, you know, someone said this to me, I don't remember who, that we tend to forget that an explanation is for a person, that you can't design the explanation without keeping the person in mind <laughs> who's going to get that explanation. So we, and I'm teaching this in my class right now, we have to understand who it is we're delivering this for and what they need. The, the issue is not how technically correct or not. It should, be, it should be valid, of course, but that's not the goal. The goal is to give an explanation that correctly describes a system at a level that is useful for the person who's going to receive it. That makes sense, and, and and this is a this is why this topic is a very interesting combination of machine learning, math, HCI, you know, psychology, and a bunch of other things. So it's 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 for me it's fun, but it's also kind of terrifying because you you feel like you have to know so many different things to do anything in this space. Absolutely, um, thanks so much. And so like sort of as a as a follow up and second question on this, um, I think like a lot of the explanations that I've seen being useful and accessible revolve around sort of the type you talked about, which is mentioning kind of feature contributions to the output prediction task so that people can do a pretty good job understanding sort of the, the basis of those variables on which a decision was made. Um, but much of the strength of a lot of modern machine learning relies on not being able to decompose things into individual features that we can necessarily reason about as easily. So if we think, for example, about like an image recognition system that takes a photo of a skin lesion and chooses whether it's benign or malignant, we can't easily decompose that into like color, shape, et cetera. Otherwise, we could just use those features. So in, in complex cases where we can't necessarily decompose the problem into easy salient features, how do you think we as a community should start thinking about explanations in this area? So again, who are you generating for? What do they want? If you're, for example, in this particular case, you're trying to use image recognition to scan for possible precancerous sort of uh, um, uh, cells in, in, a, in, a, in a tumor or something else in the brain, presumably you're going to show this to a doctor, right? Yeah. Okay, so what does the doctor want to know? What do they want to see? Do they want you to maybe put a little red circle around a region saying, this region is why the algorithm is triggering something? then maybe that circle then says, okay, I as a doctor with expertise will go look at that more carefully and see what it's saying. So the, the explanation is not going to be the definitive answer. It's going to say, hey, look here, I saw something fine. Gotcha. And that might be enough. But I won't know. And you know, I, I, don't, I don't, again, don't know your background. I'm not a doctor. I don't know whether that's enough. That's why if we ask the doctor, they might tell us, okay, what is it we need? Right. And then we might be able to come up with a system. So I can't answer your question in the abstract. It, it all depends on who the audience is and what they want to hear. But that's extremely helpful framing. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, Rocco. Uh, first, first of all, uh, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, my question is uh, of a follow up to Michael's question. So, um, in policy making, uh, the way one would define a justifiable action by an algorithm could be quite vague, right? Since human language can be vague, but as computer science, but as computer scientists, we try to be as unambiguous and precise as possible, right? So, what steps can we take to come up with a a rigorous de uh, um, definition and framework for um, defining? justifiable actions by algorithms the the quest for precision is both a strength and a weakness of computer science it's a strength for all the reasons we can imagine right precision gives you the ability to say things very clearly it gives you some a target to work towards you can write code against a precise definition it's also a weakness of the thing you're trying to define is intrinsically not precise at all Right, if you're talking about justified explanation, I don't know if that's a precise enough notion that you can define it precisely without losing something. So maybe the solution is that you have to come up with a bunch of different definitions that each captures some aspect of it. And then literally have, you know, 
I'm just making this up now. You have a dashboard that gives you different ways of coming up with the explanation. And you, you sort of, you look at them in a gestalt way, start to figure out what they are telling you about the system you're trying to understand. So again, I'm being a little vague here, I feel, but I think the quest for precision often can mask the truth that we're not dealing with things that are that precise to begin with. Even something like fairness, right? There's all this you know, discussion about definitions of fairness and all. Sometimes I feel like that's a wrong question entirely. It was helpful for a while, I think, when we first were trying to understand what it means to even define fairness. But it's become clear that a focus on fairness or bias measurements is, is only a small part of the much bigger picture of concerns around equity in, in decision making. And so, and focusing on the thing that you can define means you're limited to only looking at things that are definable. You know, I think that quote goes, if you, um, I forget how the quote goes, right? Uh, if you, if you, if you try to quantify everything you value, then you only value things you can quantify. And that's something that's a mistake we don't want to make as well. All right. Um, I actually had like a follow-up question to ask, you know, um, following some of these responses. Um, in the Bill of Rights, you talk about entraining this notion of what an individual should expect from an automated decision-making algorithm. Yep. Um, we know that there are algorithms that make decisions on systems that people interact with, and the effect of that uh, on an individual might be small, which is to say it would satisfy the axioms that you've defined in the Bill of Rights. But when individuals interact with each other and interact with the algorithm, there's a network effect that gets triggered mm -hmm. based on the way individuals uh, behave, their psychology, and that network effect can have deleterious consequences on society. So whether it's you know the way maybe misinformation spreads or whether it's riots in Southeast Asia. Um, and I, I, I don't know if, if there's like a, a concrete answer to this, but I'm curious about how the framing of the bill interacts with um, network outcomes that arise as a consequence of automated decision-making at an individual level. Right. So there couple of ways to unpack the question. One way is to talk about how the system, validated or otherwise, that has some outcome from me, has some ripple effects on people in my network because of the effect it has on me. And that's one way of asking the question. Another way is to say, the system has some decision from me, I go and do something as a consequence and that has some ripple effect on the system. Right? So I agree that you know we don't yet fully understand how to model and capture those effects. I think that's sort of a weakness, frankly, in the law as well, as well as in the document. It's funny because I've been actually doing some research on this. So there's a research question. There's an interesting question about how, for example, how do you address the fact that surveillance cameras that you know will be placed in different places will not only target individuals, but by through guilt by association might target you just happen to be next to someone who the camera was surveilling or that you know if genetic data is collected then you by virtue of contributing your genetic data are now contributing the genetic data of all your close relatives at the same time who may not have consented to do that i don't think there's an easy way out of the challenges that come with that i think the question then becomes you know if for example your genetic data goes into a database that's used as part of a probable cause investigation against some distant relative, you know, that's the, so the point at which the impact happens is, is when that individual gets picked up by the police. And then you can ask, okay, was this a legitimate use of data to get to that point? Is there, is there a proper sort of evidentiary chain that gets there? Right? So again, I'm not going to get into things I, I'm speculating on things I don't know enough about, but I think while I don't think the document addresses it, I think there are ways to think about, again, if you think through the lens of harms and impacted harms, that may be one way to get around some of these problems. But yeah, but, but your, I think your point still remains. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, I, I, I have, uh, you know, I'll ask out to the audience again if we have any final questions. And um, while we're soliciting any final questions, I'll ask, you know, you mentioned this is a starting point. Like, this is... Um, a place that gives you a foundation on which to build up uh, regulation. What what does teeth for this regulation look like? Um, but differently, you know, uh, regulation. There's a carrot and the stick me metaphor that you might be able to think of as um, 
the roles that regulation serves. Um, do you have any ideas around what that should look like in the context of automated decision making systems? So um, if you take, for example, the, the thing I was mentioning that Colorado has, has put out, um, the Colorado Division of Insurance has put out a regulation or draft regulation, they're looking for comment on it, on the kinds of data that insurers can collect when they do underwriting of policies, right? So um, if this regulation goes into play, there will be strict guidelines on what kind of data can get collected what kinds of determinations need to be done in this data, what kinds of anti-discrimination assessments need to be done. And so this is a stick. Regulators have sticks. <laughs> That's how they operate. And companies want, well, to butcher this metaphor a bit, they want clear red lines to say, if you go beyond this point, we will whack you with a stick. And if you don't go beyond this point, you'll be fine. So their goal is clarity. You know, first of all, the first their goal is to not have them. But if they, if the regulations are coming and they can't stop it, then their goal is clarity to have very clear regulations. And so that's definitely a stick-based approach. Um, the NIST uh, uh, risk management framework is an example of a carrot, right? It's a voluntary standard. It's not a standard that's going to be enforceable, but but companies may choose to adopt that standard. And you could imagine, again, one could imagine an ecosystem coming up about a virtuous cycle where, hey, I use the NIST AI risk management framework. You should use my product. It's great. You know, it's like it's like you know organic or you know green or things like that, right? So that's the sort of carrot approach. I'm not convinced the carrot approach is going to work. I think we need a lot more sticks right now, and then maybe sometime later on we can back off and you have some carrots. But I think we've had too much carrot for far too long, and nothing has happened. So we need some sticks. Sounds good. Um, I, there's one last question in chat, which is uh, from a previous uh, question: Why are we not? defining AI systems? Why keep it general as um, algorithmic uh, decision-making processes? So there's a, there's a joke, right? That, you know, when you're, if you're, if you're trying to get VC money, you're doing AI. If you're trying to hire developers, you're doing machine learning. Um, and when the, when, when the feds come a calling, no, 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 I'm just doing linear regression. I'm not doing anything AI. The, the joke, I mean, the, the point of the joke is that AI has become, not in the academic world, but in the outside world, this very fluid, ever-changing, strategically defined concept that changes depending on who are asking and for what purpose. So nailing down a definition of AI, what has been happening and what's been, so some of this has been happening in the EU already, is that if you say, okay, we're going to define AI, you're going to get tons of lobbyists from tons of companies trying to make sure the definition of AI is such that anything they do is exempt. And so the goal of putting down a definition of a system gets subverted by people trying to manipulate the definition to their own ends. So that's one part, that's a political part of it. There's also a more basic, I think, conceptual uh, type error in this. The type error is in the idea that, oh, we will define AI and then we will decide which systems are good or bad. The thing is no AI system is good or bad. They're just pieces of technology. It's how they're used and deployed and how the checks and balances are put in place that makes a system into a good one or a bad one. It's not the system by itself. It's a system in context in a particular setting. So it's almost like, you know, if you have a function with two components, you've got to have both components in it. You've got to have the technology and the domain. And that's why we were talking about, okay, the first part, the technology itself could be anything. I personally think that if an Excel spreadsheet could send you to jail, I need to look at that Excel spreadsheet. It doesn't matter that it's not fancy AI. The point is you are being impacted. And so that's why I think the separation between the automation that could be using AI or not, and the, and the, and the context of being used and what the impact is, is this two-part sort of test that you need to apply. And defining AI merely says the thing to do is to define AI so we can think, say that things that are AI are within scope and things that are not AI without scope. I don't believe that's correct. Because I think tomorrow we'll come up with something else and we'll decide to not call it AI because we, we decided not to. And then what are you going to do? That sounds good. Uh, we have a question from Madison. Hi, sorry. Yeah, just getting unmuted there. Um, thank you so much for your talk. And also, I really appreciate the um, just the, your just discussion about the ever-changing um, definition of AI and how it's used strategically by businesses, also the, by policymakers. Um, my question is about the, you mentioned how there's a lack of, we don't know what's going on necessarily with the reuse of propagate data and the 
long-term kind of downstream effects of it. And so I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about the need for or the relationship between an AI Bill of Rights and AI regulation and also data regulation. So at least like within yeah. a Canadian context, we're trying to um, revamp our data protection law, but it's just adding on kind of little changes, which fundamentally I don't, don't do enough to address kind of this new we lost uh... we don't have the equipment for the right regulation to manage the, our data ecosystem how effective can we have can the um like a ai bill of rights so do we need like a big data bill of rights or what kind of um, measures can we take in there one, one of the reasons we did not go deeper into um sort of slaying out the data rights that we wanted to focus on was because first of all we wanted to finish this job in one year and not 20. <laughs> Um, privacy law in the U.S. is very controversial, but more importantly, there's a law that is currently making its way through Congress, and it has been making its way through Congress for a while, called ADPA, which is the American Data Privacy Protection Act, which is essentially the American answer to GDPR. Um, there is, you know, a lot of, you know, hope that this could become the U.S. data protection regulation. We'll have to see what happens with that, but that's another reason why we that that's already happening, and we want to stay away from that. And I'll tell you one thing that they talk about in ADPA is this issue of secondary data use, right? So you're reusing data, you collect it for one purpose and reuse it for a second purpose, and they want to sort of cut down on those kinds of things. And that very much speaks to the concerns of, of, of uh, where AI comes in, right? This out-of-context reuse of data is exactly that point. What we tried to do was outline specific concerns associated with data that are unique to AI that probably wouldn't be covered in a privacy-focused bill, but are still data concerns. But yes, <laughs> the reason the EO, EUA Act works or will work is because it has GDPR underneath it. So you do need both those things. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you uh, very much. Oh, wait, there's uh, greetings from the Falkland Islands. Um, I'm just going to wait for a minute to see if there's a question there. I feel like it's kind of greeting where we have to wait for the question almost. I know. <laughs> While we're waiting, um, I, uh, you know, as a computer scientist, you mentioned you spent a lot of time doing technical work in the early phases of your career before you moved on into thinking more about policy. I was curious about, um, from your interactions and your time at the White House and your time as the co-author of this uh, blueprint, what do you see as new and interesting learning questions that have, you know, come about as a consequence of uh, the policy needs that you've identified here? Well, that's a whole other talk. <laughs> uh, all I'll say is that, you know, as a as an academic computer scientist um, exposed to these questions, it becomes very clear that. Probably the vast majority of the things we do, where we play this game and you say it's going to be applicable and it's really applied, and here's a motivation for them, it's not really true. <laughs> I mean, we all do this, but it's not really true. And that doesn't mean there's not good questions to study, and we should do them. But, but there are very specific kinds of questions where more research and some papers would actually give insights to policymakers on how they should shape and frame certain questions. And we don't really know what those questions are because we don't talk to policymakers enough. That's one problem. I think the other more tricky thing that I found time and again is that there is this assumption in policy circles that tech is a, a fixed concept. It's a fixed thing. That if we see technology the way it's framed right now, that's how it is and that's what we have to regulate. But there's also the possibility of changing the way we do tech design. That could be a solution to the problem as well. But that, that is very hard to bring into the discussion because you just don't have enough tech expertise to talk about this. So I think to the extent that I'm interpreting a question as a, as about the challenges of doing policy work as an academic computer scientist, I would say they're twofold, right? Knowing what questions are that are likely to have impact in the policy spaces and understanding what kinds of reframing of our questions might actually be helpful to get out of log jams where we're stuck in a bad policy place. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think those were just greetings from the Falkland Islands. <laughs> I just wanted to say, Thank you again, uh, Suresh, very much for your thoughtful presentation and for what was a very, very engaging and lively discussion session afterwards. We really appreciate you taking the time to come join us and speak with us. For the rest of the audience, uh, please join us again uh, next week at the SRI meeting for a talk by Ariel Stone at Harvard. 
on the digital revolution in healthcare, challenges, opportunities, and the need for policy innovation. Um, again, Suresh, thank you so much. And uh, let's give Suresh another round of applause, even if it is virtually. Yeah, well, thank you all for having me. It was a, it was a great discussion. It was a lot of fun. All right. Thanks. See you. Bye-bye.